All right, so this is questions and answers. So I've uh, asked you to prepare your questions uh, to some of you. Some of you I've mentioned to you to prepare your questions on that one. So uh, may I have the first question? And uh, I, I can't claim that I know everything, but I want to do the best that I can and give a satisfactory. OK, Brother Ralph. Okay, um, can you explain to me the, just the parable of the fig tree? OK, then. So Brother Ralph's question is concerning the parable of the fig tree. Please open up to Matthew chapter uh, 24. Oh, Matthew 24. Oh, I forgot to erase that part at the top right there. So. Are you talking about um, the fig tree that Jesus was talking about, or are you talking about the parable of the trees in the Old Testament? Um, it was more about um, Jesus' fig tree. But... Okay, then. So, fig tree. So, is it... Now, Jesus mentioned fig tree several times, so I just want to make sure that I got the right fig tree. <laughs> is it the one that Jesus cursed, yeah, or is it the... One, yes. in Mark. Okay, then. In Mark. Okay then, so Jesus pointed his finger at the fig tree and say from henceforth you don't grow anymore, correct? Okay then, so we're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Mark. And in this passage at the book of Mark, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's doing is that he was uh, passing by a fig tree. And when he passed by the fig tree, the Lord Jesus Christ, he actually cursed it. So there are some people who kind of use this as proof that Jesus is not omniscient, so to speak. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 11. So we're going to, I'm going to explain what this means and the controversy concerning this where Jesus does not seem to know. So the first passage we're going to look at is the book of Mark chapter 11, and then we're going to look at verse 12. Mark chapter 11, and then we'll look at uh, verse 12. So that, that's a pretty big tree, but oh well. <laughs> so... In the parable of the fig tree right here, the Lord Jesus Christ, he passed by it. And then when he passed by it, he was hungry and then he cursed at it. So this fig tree received the curse of God. And he said, henceforth, that you will not grow from this time forever. And actually, it came to pass. Now, why would the Lord Jesus Christ do that? And what did, we, what did I mean earlier that it seemed like he was confused? Like he didn't know that it would happen. That's what it looked like. Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. So it seems right here that this lack of fruit, by the way, Mark also mentioned that during this season, it was, not, uh, it was not time yet. So it seemed like Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, was dumb, as the atheist would like to picture it. So that means that he's not really God after all. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Verse 14, And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So then they heard Jesus Christ uh, cursing the fig tree. So then, why in the world would Jesus Christ do this to a harmless little tree? That's just very cruel of God. So then, the first thing is this. Let's use some common sense here. So I'm going to give a common sense argument, number one, which I really don't believe in. But it's such a common sense argument that sometimes you've got to think about it, okay? Sometimes you've got to realize that even though the time of the season is not yet for, the, uh, for a certain fruit to come out, sometimes there may be a thing where something comes out a little earlier, so then the verse, it says in verse 13, if haply he, what, might find. It didn't say that Jesus automatically assumed, oh, I'm going to find fruit on it. It didn't say that. Happily he might find. It's like you're in the middle of a desert and you're trying to find water. Now, you know that there's no water out there, but you're happily hoping that there might be a puddle or something out there. So that's just common sense. You've got to realize that. Plus, you've got to understand this. The Bible says that the book of Luke... So we're going to look at the book of, keep your hand here, and then we're going to look at the book of Luke, chapter 2. you got to understand this, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he was actually growing in wisdom. So this did not mean that Jesus was not omniscient. As a matter of fact, what you got to understand is that the Bible says that the book of Philippians, chapter 2, which we won't turn over there, Philippians, chapter 2, Jesus Christ said that he humbled himself. 
and became a man. That's why he said, took upon him the form of a servant. So because he took upon him the nature of a man, what happened is he had to go through the limitations that man went through as well. So you got to realize this. He's fully God and he's fully man. He is both fully God and fully man. So because of that, he had to uh, go through situations where he had to go through the limitations of manhood. Otherwise, he is not fully man. Jesus Christ, he had to maintain. We strongly believe in that. We strongly believe that Jesus Christ had to have 100% both deity and humanity. It's not like a 50-50 thing or 75% deity, 25% humanity. That's not how it works. It's fully God and fully man. And Jesus himself can choose whatever function he desires. Okay, so we're going to look at the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 40. Notice the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So notice right here that he was growing, that he was growing. So the first thing is just common sense you got to think about. Common sense is that the verse said, if happily might find even though it wasn't the time of the season. Because you never know, you might find something there that can come out earlier during the season. All right, so that's point number one. Now, if an atheist next time uses that argument on you, then you can tell him, okay, then next time when you go out to your garden and you're hungry and you want to eat something, don't, uh, don't try to happily find something where you might find something that would early blossom or something like that. Or if you're in the middle of a desert, you're thirsty, don't try to find water when you're in the middle of the desert. So, so this is a ridiculous notion. This is going through a human nature that's craving for hunger and thirst. So it's a natural human reaction. It's not like Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was a dumb human, then every atheist must be stupid out there. Because I bet you they would do that if they were in the middle of no man's land out there. Okay, now, aside from that point, it's not like you're going to... Okay, I just have to park it right here a little bit. You bunch of foolish atheists out there, especially those of you guys who are trolling us, I mean, it's not like when you're in the middle of a desert, you're going to be so much filled with science that you're going to go, well, scientifically and geographically speaking, I know that I'm not going to find anything out there, so I, I better stop wishing for water and wishing for something that I might find. No! Your body function, your fleshy reaction, your human reaction will still crave and hope for something to drink out there and find something. <laughs> okay. No, not all the science in the world is going to make you, uh, is going to help you, and you're not going to apply that when your flesh is starving for something and thirsty for something. So Jesus, his human nature was craving, starving for something. See? Okay, now here's the. But I don't actually really believe this. So I'm going to even give a far better argument right here. So that should be answer enough. The second thing is this, okay? Why would he curse it now? That seems like a mean thing to do. Why would he curse it? The reason why is this. So we already solved this question mark issue. Now we got to realize why he cursed it. The reason why is because he was talking about something right here concerning the generation of Israel. We're also going to look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. The fig tree is representing something here. What it is representing is the nation of Israel being cursed. That's what it's representing. So we're going to look at the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 21. Let's start at verse 18. Now, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? So we see that repetition of what happened where the disciples were amazed. But Jesus, the reason why he did that in verse 21 and 22 is to teach them a lesson. 
So remember that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would not do this unless he's teaching them some kind of lesson here. Now go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Look at this. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Now look at this fig tree, what Jesus talks about. We're going to look at verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So, by the way, at verse 32, you notice that Jesus knew about the season. So it's not like he was being dumb where he was going to a fig tree. No, he already knew that three chapters later after Matthew 21. But see, he's giving a parable of the fig tree. Verse 33, so likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So it's his coming that's near. Verse 34, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass to all these things be fulfilled. Now look at that. He likened this generation to that fig tree. So that's what he was thinking about here. Now who is this generation? The context at verse 16, in Judea. See that? Verse 20, Sabbath. Jesus Christ was speaking to his disciples who were what? Jews. So you got to realize this, this is going to be a Jewish context here. So there's something concerning this fig tree that relates to Jews. It relates to somehow Jews. Is that the case, Pastor? Hmm, I wonder. Let's look at the book of Jeremiah chapter 24. Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah chapter 24. It's representing the nation of Israel. So that's why what we believe concerning this fig tree in Jeremiah chapter 24 and Matthew 24 is that based on Matthew 24 and Jeremiah 24, uh, let me put this together, is that when God restores the nation of Israel, restore restored Israel when Israel is restored then from that countdown it said starting from there then this generation will not pass so it's the generation who lives to see the re from the restored Israel when Israel becomes restored that particular generation who is there during when Israel is restored will live to see the coming of Jesus Christ so the coming of Christ, they will live to see it. They're going to live to see that day on the coming of Jesus Christ. But they're from a generation of the restored nation of Israel. When was Israel res restored? We all know in history, Israel lost its nation, but then it was restored somewhere between 1947 to 1948. 48 is the standard. From here then the generation who lived that time is going to live to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why we know we're very close to the rapture. We're very close to the tribulation because this generation can't live that long forever. It's going to come very soon. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 24 and then we'll read verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah. See that? Those are the figs. It's the Jews who lost their nation, carried away captivity, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Uh, look at verse 6. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will what? Bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. See that? So that's Israel returning to their land, their nation. That happened in 1948. Now, here's the thing is that we get, there are some anti-Semite, post-trib, weird cultic fringes out there who will claim that they are King James only independent fundamental Baptists. And when you see those kind of bearded people, you better shut it off and leave them. <laughs> so those kind of people, you got to understand this, is that those people will, will Here's another issue. They're going to use this passage at Mark to prove that because it said forever, it actually said forever. So because it said forever, that means the nation of Israel is cursed forever and cannot grow again. That's their logic. Now the problem is this, is that 
Notice the verse said, what generation? This generation. If you look back at Mark 11, you know what it said? It said this. It's that particular tree. There's a reason for this. Because it's going to, be, it's going to differentiate from each other here. Look at Romans 11. Well, I don't get it. You know, it can't grow forever. Well, yeah, because it's dead. God has to take out those branches. And you know what he does? He just re replants it with a new one. Right. Oh, oh, you ever thought about that? So these anti-Semites that want to attack the nation of Israel and say, they're forever gone, they're forever gone. We're the replacement. Remember, I'm the man of God here, and we're going to replace them. You got to remember this is that that kind of non shenanigan nonsense. <laughs> look, look, and I'm going to call these weird cultic fringes dummies, all right? Those of you who don't know about this stuff, it's okay. It's totally understandable. That's why you can get caught away by these kind of weird cultic deceivers. So those cultic deceivers, that's why I'm pounding those guys, because I hate it when they deceive souls out there. So those kind of dummies out there, they just don't read Romans 11. Now look at this right here. Look at Romans 11. He, he even mentions he can replant them again with a new branch, the Jews. Romans chapter 11, verse 18. Boast not against the branches. So those are the Jews. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Ah, look at that. So the, the root of the tree, the Jews are still in there. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, Jews, take heed lest he also spare not thee. See, he's going to get rid of the Gentile branches too. Isn't he about to? Yeah. America gave up God. All the other nations have forsaken God. He's going back to Israel soon. Now look at this. Uh, verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, which the Bible mentioned at Revelation 7, that the Jews are coming back again, shall be what? Graft in, for God is able to graft them in again. See, so the ones that are forever, they're already dead and long gone. And a lot of them, sadly, are in hell because they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But God is not done with the nation of Israel because that particular generation of the fig tree is gone. But then one day, this particular generation right here is going to be different. And this generation is going to be different from this other generation right here. See that? They don't pay attention. So there's the answer to that one.